I want to talk to you today about being committed to the call of missions. Committed to the call of missions. Let me read a couple verses out of Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Paul said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. That's a good thing to push for. I don't want to stand ashamed when I stand before Jesus. I don't want to be ashamed before him here, and I don't want to be ashamed before him when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He said, I expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. Lord, in these next few moments would you anoint me to preach your word? Would you give me strength and power and would you take me beyond my abilities, for they are so limited, Lord. And Lord, I don't just ask you to anoint me. I ask you to anoint everyone that is sitting under the sound of my voice, that they will have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. And God, may we respond and be advance your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In these two verses, Paul expresses his commitment to the call of Christ. He expresses his commitment to his life mission. Now, Paul gets in trouble with the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 22, and he stands before them, and he tells them of an experience that changed his life. He tells about being on the road to Damascus one day, and he has in his hand letters that give him the right to imprison Christians. And he said it was about at noon. I was going along, and all of a sudden a light shone from heaven, and the brightness of it was beyond I could comprehend. It was so powerful that it knocked me off of the donkey I was riding into the dust, and I cried out to God, and I said, Lord, who are you? After he heard God say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the voice answered, I am Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus spoke to him and said these words, and the Lord said to me, arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told the things which are appointed for you to do. And as he concludes that story, Story, he tells them in chapter 22, verse 14 and 15, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and seek the just one and hear the voice of his mouth and you will be witnesses to all men of what you have seen and heard. Paul said, I, been, I was given a mission. I was a, given a mission and that mission was to take the call and the of the gospel to all people. And I took that mission very, very seriously. See, we are called to total commitment. Did you hear me? I got news for you that this is not a Sunday morning worship experience if you're gonna follow Jesus. Thank God for the Sunday morning worship experience. But this is a life-changing experience. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, for, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and he loses his own soul? For what would a man give in exchange for his soul? If you're sitting here this morning and you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are headed in the wrong direction. What you need today is to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. What you need today is to respond to the tug that is on your heart today. That is the Spirit of God drawing you out of the life you're living to a new life. But when you say yes, then you're all in. 
Can I get a witness? You don't get to say, well, I think I'll have Jesus on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. A little bit on Saturday, but the rest of the time will just be mine. Jesus said you take up your cross. It's total commitment. It is giving yourselves totally to him. So Paul's response to the high calling to missions was to commit his life to Christ in such a way that he would glorify Christ, whether by his life or by his death. I want to live right and want to die right. Let me say it again. I want to live right and I want to die right. Friend, I want to bring glory to Christ on how I live, and I want to die a, a death that brings glory to him. Now, I got two points this morning that ought to encourage you. You know, some preachers, you know, I try to give people hope when I preach. Do you ever listen to a preacher and, and you didn't know where he was, and you was pretty convinced he didn't know where he was? So I'm going to keep you in the loop where we're at. I got two main points, but a whole bunch of sub points. But anyway, two things I want to talk to you about. First, missions is accomplished when we are committed to die for Christ and we are committed to die with Christ. Paul was committed to bring glory to God even in his death. All, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Our early missionaries in the Assemblies of God, many of them, when they got ready to go overseas, packed part of their belongings in their coffins because they were all in. They were all in. They made a commitment to the cause of Christ. Paul lived in such a way that his death would bring glory to God. He could say at the end of his life, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. See, you got to be willing to die right. When our young men enlist in the armed forces, they make, raise their hand and they make a commitment that they will defend the Constitution of the United States and that they will defend this country from all that would come against it. And they sign up to be willing to live or die to defend that. That's a big deal. And for you that serve, thank you for what you were willing to do. Thank the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands that have given their life so that we might set here free today. How can we think that we can make any less commitment to Christ than to give everything to him? We are enlisted in a greater army than any of the armies of this world. We are a part of the heavenly host of God and we have been called to total commitment. Hebrews chapter 11 tells of the great heroes of faith. And as the writer of Hebrews is summing it up, he brings and he tells about all those that were, were so great in seeing great miracles. And then he brings another group. And he said others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. Others had their backs cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All of these earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. Are you willing to die for Christ? You say, wait a minute, preacher. I've come to, you help me and encourage me today. I, it's going to get better. But I want to get the truth that you got to lay your light off on the line. 
I'm supposed to have a picture coming up right now, but I brought the wrong thing with me. But I, if, um, I have a picture of a young man, and he is J.W. Tucker, a young man about 30 years old. J.W. Tucker, Steve Saint, Peter Fleming, Ed McCauley, and Roger Yonderan made a commitment to reach a tribe in the Amazon of the Aka Indians. This group was a very warlike group. And the Shell Oil Company had discovered oil in that area of Ecuador. And they were making raids in against the Shell Oil people. So the government of Ecuador and the Shell Oil people said, we've got to stop this. And uh, while how they were going to do it, they were going to come against this tribe of people and eliminate them. So these young men, young missionaries, make a commitment to go reach this group. They land their plane on the beach of one of these rivers, of tributaries of the Amazon. And there they begin to share with these Aka Indians, the gospel. Everything goes well for a few days. And one of the tribal people tells a lie on them and incites the tribe. They come against them. These men were armed, but chose not to kill these people. And there they all died on that sandy shore of that river. But the story doesn't end there. J. Jim Elliott's came back, wife came back, Elizabeth Elliott, established a missions work there. Just a few years ago, the very man that was a part of killing her husband came through America doing missions conventions with Jim Elliott's son because they had won the very people that they had killed their father. You say, wait a minute. Why would anybody do this? Because they seen the eternal value of a soul. And they said it was more valuable than their own and they laid down their life. A man named J.W. Tucker, one of our Assemblies of God missionaries that ministered to the Congo. And in the 60s, in the early 60s, there was great turmoil throughout the Congo. There was a time of revolution. There was a time that as the, the native people of the Congo were breaking loose from the, the colonial powers and the communist powers were now taking advantage of this and, and it was a, a time of great, great trouble. J.W. Tucker, one of our missionaries, a young man with a family. He was home on furlough and the, the tensions began to be greater and it was time for him to return. And someone asked him, Brother Tucker, what are you going to do? He said, God told me to go. He didn't tell me to come back. And the story is this. They go back. J.W. Tucker is taken captive by the rebels. They lock him up and use a monastery there to be a prison. Each week, his wife would call to check on him. They came and broke into the monastery, took J.W. Tucker out of that monastery, they beat him to death, threw him in the back of a truck, took him to one of the rivers, the Bomogandi River. And there they threw his body in the river and the crocodiles ate his body. J.W. Tucker's wife called the monastery one answered the phone and she asked for her husband and the answer was this, 
he is in heaven. Well, you would think, man, that's quite a price to pay. But the story doesn't end there. This tribe that lived along that, along that river, the Mangbedo tribe was a very warlike tribe and they were in the midst of, of problems and the, the king, the chief of that tribe, reached out to the government officials of the Congo and said, would you send us somebody to help us so that we can get order in our, among our people? They sent a man whose name was, they referred to him as the brigadier. An African man, strong, tall. He was one of the military police and they sent him and he tried to help them. But the story is a month before J.W. Tucker died, he led this man to the Lord. So this man is trying to reach these people, trying to reach them with the gospel and nothing was happening. But he heard of a tradition that was among that tribe. And the tribe had a tradition that any man whose blood flowed in their river, they had to listen to the message. He found that out. He called the chief. He called all the leaders of the villages and said, I want to tell you, I have a message for you. He reminded them of their tradition. He told them about J.W. Tucker, a man who had been thrown into their river, and he said, here is his message. He tells them about a God that loved them so much that he sent his own son to die for them and that they did not have to live in the bondage of sin anymore. The good news, friend, is you do not have to live in the bondage of sin anymore. There is a power that breaks the bondage of sin. It will break it in Africa. It will break it in Barnett. As he began to tell that story, it is recorded that the Spirit of God fell in that room. They begin to fall to their face and weep and cry out to God for mercy. That happened in 1964. If you go into the Democratic Republic of the Congo today and you go down the Mokondi River and you go among the Magbeto tribe, you will find in each village along that river and its tributaries, there are assemblies of God churches preaching the gospel with thousands of people being saved because somebody was willing to die for the cause of Christ. I'm not talking about a little commitment. I'm not talking about an easy religion. I'm talking about giving your life to something that is worth dying for. Living for Jesus is worth dying for Jesus. Paul was not only committed to die for Christ, but he was willing to die with Christ. For he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not only are you have to be willing to die for Christ, but are you willing to die with Christ? That is a daily dying to self. And that is taking up your cross daily and following him. Dying with Christ allows his life to live out through you. The life of Christ is all about missions. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Don't tell me you love Jesus and you don't love lost people. I was excited as I seen your announcements how you are reaching out to hurting and bound people in your area. So many times our churches are just little resorts where we all come in and we all get our blessing and we all, you know, we got people we like and we don't shake hands with the people we don't like and we got our little group and we all huddle together and we just bless each other while the world goes to hell. That's not right. <laughs> That's not right. You have to have a vision for missions here, but you have to have a vision for missions around the world. I got news for you. New Life Barnett is a worldwide outreach center. I'm going to say that again. This is a worldwide outreach center. 
You have a commitment to here, but you have a commitment to the world. And so we're going to live so that we die for Christ and we die with Christ. If you study the history of the Assemblies of God's missions, which you're a part of, you will find one of the most amazing things happened that in the 1930s during the Great Depression where there was great lack in this nation like we have never known, missions grew at its greatest rate recorded. It's not about what you have, it's about being willing to give from what you have. It's not about what you, your great amounts that you possess, it's willing to be a channel for God to flow through you. Amen? Amen? May we not be ashamed because we are not committed enough to be a part of God's plan to reach the world by giving to missions. I'm going to challenge you to give in a little bit. I don't want to surprise you. We, but we're not going to take an offering. Can everybody smile at me? <laughs> I'm not going to take an offering. I'm just going to take faith promises. But I'm going to do my best to enlist you as part of your life in seeing that missions is advanced in the world. So that's point one. Point two. Everybody smile. Say he's at least halfway done. And I pray his second half is shorter than his first. Point two, missions is accomplished when we are committed to live for Christ and to live in Christ. Paul said, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said to the church at Philippi in chapter 2, verse 17, And yes, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the, on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. For this same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. If you read the, the Bible, and, and the Old Testament is, is a, 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 a it show, it's types and shadows of that which would come through Christ. And you'll see a sacrifice system in the Old Testament. And if you study that, they would go worship God and they would break a lamb or they'd bring a, 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 some kind of animal. And most of those, when you got in and you made the sacrifice, this is how it went. They cut that sacrifice up. Now the priest, in part of it, had this hook deal. And they went in and hooked part of it, and the priest got to live on part of the sacrifice. So the priest got some of it. The uh, part of it was given over totally to God, and it was burned on the altar. And the other part of the sacrifice, you got it. So when you went to sacrifice, you, all, you really had a big barbecue. Can I get a witness? Love to barbecue. So it was a party. And I think church ought to be a party. Can I get a witness? You know, I went to church and it looked like folks were baptized in dill pickle juice. You know, they, ooh, they sour. You know, their favorite song was, I shall not be moved. And they sat there dead and they weren't moved. But in the Old Testament, when you came to worship, it was a celebration. It was a sharing with God. It was a wonderful thing, and it was an exciting time. But there was one sacrifice, and it was the drink offering. And when that sacrifice was poured out, you didn't get any of it. It was all God's. Paul said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. See, I want to live being poured out. I want to be an offering to him, committed. About two and a half years ago, a young man walks into my office, and if you're going to be a Southern Missouri District missionary, one of the first people you got to meet is me. So he walks into my office and he says, Brother Stan, I feel God stirring in my heart. I said, well, tell me your story, Nathan. He said a number of years ago, I was in Afghanistan. I worked as a guard 
for many of the companies there. He said, I hated the Afghan people. They were trying to kill me, and I hated them. But he said, God has got a hold of my heart, and he has called me to go to Afghanistan. And I said, have you counted the cost? Because he has a wife and two beautiful little girls. Have you counted the cost? See, he's being poured out. He said, we have counted the cost. And we have decided that the safest place we could be on the planet would be in the will of God. Now that's why I challenge you to partner with people in giving. I don't know about you, but I do not have vacation plans for Afghanistan. Any of you got a vacation going to Afghanistan? I really don't want to go to Afghanistan. I, you know, it doesn't sound like a pleasant place to me. But I must partner with people who are called to go. Amen? Somebody that's willing to pour their life out into a group of people where they cannot go publicly and preach the gospel, but they have to live a life where they touch people one person at a time and try to establish a, a beachhead of the church of Jesus Christ, and they will pour their lives out. And I can say, well, no, I can't give. You know, I, I got so many obligations, and, and, you know, that's all the church is after is my money. Get over it. You can cut back on a coffee or two and be able to give to missions. Not change your lifestyle at all. Everybody smile at me. <laughs> Pastor, I'll be gone in a little bit and you can put this back together. After I leave, Cassie Bennett, the first couple I was talking about is Nathan and Tara Anders and their little girls they are now overseas on the border of Afghanistan, learning the language, hoping soon to move in. We have a young lady that we just sent to Jordan. Her name is Cassie Bennett. I, I've just received uh, Facebook pictures and accounts. And this young single woman when she goes where she goes, she has to wear the garb. She's got to have her face covered. She's got to go through all that she goes through so that she might pour her life out so that somebody might hear about Jesus. That's why we do missions. Let me tell you why the Assemblies of God exist. Not so that we can just be another church and another denomination. We are not a denomination, we are a fellowship. And the main reason we have come together is so that we can together be more effective than we can be separated. We can send missionaries, we can equip our missionaries, we can reach our world together. Let's be a part of something bigger than we are so that we can do a powerful work for the cause of Christ. Can you give Jesus a hand clap? I just returned, I was in the Ivory Coast in November of last year and there with the Teague family as they pour their lives out, pour their lives out. We did a Tuesday night film next to a, to a Muslim village, Islamic village. We showed a film about a young man that gave his life to Christ and how he had to change his life. And I know, I'll never forget this experience. So we got a film set up, screen set up out in this field. We've got chairs and it's just about getting dark. And so they, you start playing music real loud because, uh, you know, they like it loud. And so I'm sitting there and I'm by myself and this guy about six, seven, six, eight comes and looks down on me. And he is not happy that I am there. Now, I can't speak his language, and he can't speak mine, but we are communicating. I am understanding that he's not happy, and I'm concerned. And I'm looking for somebody. I'm, where is the missionary? 
And I'm pointing him to that direction. He is an Islamic leader of that village and he is very upset that we are there. And he is trying to tell us we have no right to be there. And, and then the leaders, the missionary and the leaders are explaining we do have right to be here. And I remember he jumps on his motorcycle and off he takes. And I'm just telling you, maybe you'd be more spiritual and not think this, but I'm thinking, I hope he doesn't bring a bunch of folks back with him. Because, you know, people do die over there for preaching Jesus. So we show that film and see that the, these missionary families, I go through that, you know, a couple times a year. I go overseas, but they live it every day. Every day they live it. They stop the film right before it ends. I had an invitation and I got to preach. So I thought, what should I preach? So I preached Jesus' first sermon. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here we've got an Islamic village where people are committed to Islam. I preach that Jesus says, turn the, from where you're, the direction you're going and come into the kingdom of God. At the end of the message, an invitation is given. They count 72 people that respond to that invitation. And among those group was a young man dressed in a white, complete white robe. When we're over, I'm saying, what about this guy? And they, and they explained that he was in training to be a Taliban fighter. And he had given his life to Christ. Everything changed for him that night. He's a marked young man now. But see, the Teagues are over there pouring out their life every day. And what we're challenging you is to partner with people like that. Your church missions budget will find missionaries that you can partner with and pour into them as they're pouring out their lives. Paul Valeris is a missionary to Newark, New Jersey. I'd just as soon go to Africa is to live in New York, New Jersey. Okay? Now, we're all country folks here. We understand that that's a different world than we live in. It's a dangerous world. But he has spent over 25 years establishing churches in Newark. Today, there, where there were no works, now there are several thriving churches where people's lives are being changed because he's being poured out. For me to live is Christ. And I'm, I'm willing to pour myself out and live for Christ. Surely we can agree and partner with people like this. Paul lived a total commitment to Christ. He says, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. When I die, live for Christ, I do what Christ wants me to do. When I live in Christ, his power comes and lives in me. Not only am I going to live for Christ, but I'm going to live in Christ. Jesus said at the great feast, he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come and drink of me. And if he will do that, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Not only do I live for Christ, but I live in Christ and he becomes my source. And he flows through me. Lives are changed when we live in Christ. Missionary Carol Deal, many of you know him. He's missionary, him and Gail Deal to Equatorial Guinea in Africa. Went 30 years ago to that country where there was no work. There was no church. And poured himself out. And today, this year, they will celebrate 30 years of the Assemblies of God establishing powerful, strong churches in, in the, one of the worst dictatorships on the planet. Newsweek rated it among the five worst dictatorships on the planet Earth. How do you say they function? You pour yourself out, Jesus builds his church. You got to partner with people like that. A few years ago, I went to Madagascar. 
It's a beautiful place. And we were doing men's conference there. And then on Sunday, they divide us all up. And so I was to go to a place to preach. And where I was to go was called Little Texas. I didn't know why it's called Little Texas. So what they do, the missionary takes you and he dumps you out, essence, in essence. I get out and he says, you wait right here because your interpreter is coming. And I'm thinking, I wish he was here right now. And so he shows up. And so I begin to follow him. And we're, going, we're crossing a bridge over a canal and we're going into Little Texas. And he says, do you know why we call this Little Texas? And I said, no. He said, why we call it Little Texas? Because of all the shootouts. He said it was very common on Sunday morning to see bodies floating in the canal. And I'm thinking, dear Jesus, <laughs> I wish I was in Missouri. <laughs> but he looked at me and smiled. Oh, he said, Brother Welch, it's not that way anymore. He said, we've established the church here. And the whole community has changed. See, that's what, when we live for Christ and we allow Christ to live in us, then we make an influence in our world. I followed him through alleys and then we walked for about 10 minutes and all of a sudden I began to hear some of the most beautiful singing I'd ever heard on this planet. And I walk up to a church that is about... If you eliminated one of these sides, it would be about the size of this church all the way back with a thousand people or more packed in it. You can get more Africans in a building, you can Americans. We got to have our space. They don't care about space. They'll pack in. Of course, they're skinnier than us too. That helps. They're singing like heaven itself. Why? Because missionaries had poured themselves out and lives has changed. Now I get to my club. In August of 2015, I get an invitation to go to Vanuatu. Anybody ever been to Vanuatu? Anybody ever been to Fiji? Well, if you go to Vanuatu, you go out to Los Angeles, get on a plane, go to Fiji and take a left. And out in the South Pacific, 1,200 miles off of the coast of Brisbane, Australia, is an island chain called Vanuatu, where there are 84 inhabited islands in that chain. I had the awesome privilege of installing new missionaries who are at home beginning furlough right now, the Sam Paris family on the island of Tana. And that was a great experience, and I don't have time to tell it, but... Some other time I'll tell that was quite an experience. But my second responsibility was I got an invitation to preach district council. Brother Montgomery, I don't know about you, but I thought that's a pretty big deal. Now here's what I thought was going to happen. Now how we do district council is we go to Springfield usually, one of the larger towns in the district. We go to the largest churches. It's either James River or Central. We're at James River this year. And we all come together and we stay in nice hotels and motels and we have a wonderful time. So I figured what they're going to do is go to the largest town, to the largest church, and everybody's going to come. That's what they normally did. But not the year I was there. They decide that they're going to take district council to the bush. The leadership says, we always require them to come in to us. We're going to go to them. Sounds good to me. So I'm told that we're going to take a little drive, get on a boat, cross the ocean a little bit, cross Big Bay, and go to a village. Now, here's what I've got in mind. That, you know, we're, we're going to go down to the ocean. We're going to, there's going to be a pier that sticks out in the ocean. You all been to the ocean? They got piers and the boats are tied up to the piers. Well, we get in the Speed the Light truck, which has been purchased by Southern Missouri youth, and we take a trip. We start off on George Bush Highway. 
really, there's a highway in Vanuatu on the island of Santos that is called George Bush. I guess while he was president, he gave money and they built a nice road. Well, then we turned off of that road and we hit a gravel road and then we hit a path. And about five hours later, we come to the beach and there on the beach was not a pier. There was a boat. It was an aluminum boat. It was a V-bottom, about an 18 foot V-bottom aluminum boat with a 35 horse Mercury. And we're going out on the ocean. We get in that and there are 10 of us. Brother Curtis Washam. You all know Curtis, most of you, a lot of you do. He was with me. So we get in the boat, there's 10 of us plus chickens and some rocks. Now this is volcanic islands. There are rocks everywhere. I'm a little concerned. Not only are, are we in there and 10 people, it's our luggage is in there. And, and the boat's full and it's a 35 horse Mercury. It's not a 300 horse like we got on the lakes out here. It's a 35 horse. And I say to the missionary, why are we carrying rocks? He explains to me they were special rocks. They didn't split in the fire, so they cooked with these rocks. They were very valuable. So off we take, and we take a three-hour journey. Now, there were no seats in that boat. There were metal benches. They have made an impression on me that I still have to this day, I believe. And for three hours, we go wham. Of course, 30 high five horse Mercury, you're not going to get on top of anything. So we're just slamming through every wave. They tell me how smooth the sea is as we beat through it. So we finally, and I'm hearing during that journey, the theme to Gilligan's Island is going through my mind on that three hour tour. So we finally get to a place and this, we're going to land. And so there's no pier there either. And this is what they do, honestly. Take that boat, they back it off out, turn it backwards with the motor in toward the bank, wait for the biggest wave they can find, and we ride the wave in. I never surfed before, but I did then in the boat. So we land, and up on the bank above is a few huts, and I think we've arrived. Oh, no. We've got a five mile hike in front of us. And so through the jungle we walk, we go th first through this coconut grove. It was a beautiful place. And I said to the missionary, oh, man, this is a gorgeous place to Brian Webb. And he said, yeah, the only problem is you don't know when those coconuts are gonna fall. He'd no more said that and about three feet from us fell a coconut. Now you don't wanna get hit in the head with coconut. So we finally get into this village Five miles later, it's a beautiful, next to this mountain, clear stream running by it. And there's about 400 people to 500 people that have walked in to have district council, just like us, because there was no road, no road there at all. No electric. We have a, we, we get to stay, Curtis and I gets to stay in the chief's house, the only house in town with a floor. Now we slept on the floor and the hogs loved to stay under the floor. So we had, we had company with us. The chief of the village, when we got there, he had a megaphone and he made an announcement. The, the uh, missionary, Brother Webb said, do you know what he said? I said, of course I don't know what he said. He just announced which outhouse belongs to the white men. So we had our own outhouse. We had a shower. Now the shower consisted of this little thatch hut and it had a bowl of water in it with another bowl. Now the only thing about that shower, you go in it, you could see out pretty good. Now that's a pretty good sign if you can see out, you can see in. Well after a few days, it didn't make any difference. It was time to take a shower, whatever was going on. So we had church. Each day during the day in the morning we would we had have pastor seminars. Brother Curtis taught and I taught. Afternoon, they would do their business and at night we would have services. And during those services, they were, they were powerful. 
that well, they, somebody carried in a generator. So we had a PA system because most folks overseas believe God is deaf. Why I come to that opinion is there's only one way they run the PA system and it's wide open. And if it's not squealing a little bit, they're not happy. So we're out in the middle of the jungle and it's squealing and we're having church and, and it's a wonderful time. Scores of people uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People are healed. We baptize the last day, 27 people. We get ready to leave and I get to this club. So we have to go through ceremonies. And the chief of the village comes to me with this club. And you can see there used to be streamers that ran down. It's still a little tape and you can see. And he comes to me with this club and, and through the, in, the missionary interprets and this is what he says. He says, if you had came a few years ago and stepped on our territory, I would have met you with this club and I would have killed you. Now you gotta understand the people of Vanuatu are some of the last recorded cannibals on the planet. They eat people. You go to a war with them, the losers are lunch. I'm just telling you the way it is. Well, I'm standing there and this is going through my mind. I'm thinking, yeah, and you would have thought happy days are here again because we really like white meat. And Curtis Washam is standing next to me. And I'm thinking, he's bony. They wouldn't even have touched him. He would have got to go home. They would have let him free. But they had to eat me for sure. He comes with me, and I'll never forget, he lifts his hand with his club in his hand. And he says these words, but you sent us missionaries. And they told us about a God that loved us so much that he sent his own son to die for us. And that message has changed my heart. He said, I don't want to kill you anymore. You're my brother. And I was happy. And he wraps his arms around me and embraces me. It changed my life. Because now I know what missions really does. It takes people at their lowest point. Folks, if you're eating people, you need to get saved. You know, I hear, well, let's just leave people alone in their own customs. We don't want to bother people. If folks are eating one another, they need to change. Can I get a witness? Well, we got people that are not eating each other physically, but they're eating and destroying one another. And we must bring the gospel message to everyone. He wraps his arms around me and holds me close. One of these days, I will see him in heaven because we invested in missionaries. Amen. Jesus is our great example. He prayed until his sweat became like drops of blood. He gave, he, he who was rich became poor so that we might be rich in him. He went. He left heaven. He said, I didn't come to serve, but to, to be served, but I come to serve and give my life a ransom for many. Are you committed to pray, to give, and to go, my challenge to you today is be a part of something bigger than you are. Plug into the missions vision of this church. Be a monthly missions giver. Okay? Has everybody got a, have we handed, do you have your missions faith card? Do you have them? Ushers, would you please make sure everybody gets a missions faith card? They're in your bulletin. If you have your bulletin, you have one. If you, all right, now wave them at me. Oh, we're doing better. Well, every, if anybody does not have one of these faith promise cards, I want you to raise your hand. I want everybody in the building to have one. I don't care if you fill it out or not, but the first thing, I want you to have it. Anybody doesn't have one, raise your hand. Here's some over here to my right. Anyone else? 
ushers are coming your way. If you'll just up here and toward the front, a few pages here, a few pews here. Keep your hand up. There's some more here, some down here. Now, before we do this, and this is very, this is the reason I've come. But before I do this, I want everybody to look at me. Just give me one minute. If you're here today and you're not certain you're ready for heaven, this message of God's love and hope, if it applied to the man in Vanuatu, applies to you. You don't have to leave here lost in your sin. Jesus wants to save you today. If there's anybody in the house that you would say, Brother Stan, I'd like to change the way I'm living. I'd like to have hope because I don't have hope now. I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I don't have that assurance, but I'd like to have that assurance. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Anyone across the building? We're not going to embarrass you, but we're going to, yes, sir. Thank you for raising your hand. Is anybody else? You say, I'm not sure I'm ready to go to heaven, but I want to make sure. Amen. Sir, I'm going to pray with you right now. Pastor or somebody will be praying with you before the service is over. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for this individual and others that need to know you. Let them trust you as their Lord and Savior. Your word said if they confess with their mouth that you are the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, they will be saved. Save these people. Write their name in the book of life. I ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you for these lives. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write your name where it says name. Everybody know your name? You say, well, wait a minute. Just write your name. If God doesn't speak to you about this, you don't have to do a thing. But would you please just write your name in there? Everybody got your name in it? Wave it at me if you got your name on it. Okay. I'm waiting on a few of you. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray with this in our hand. And we're going to ask Jesus to speak to us. And we're going to say, Jesus, what would you have me to give monthly for the next 12 months? This is not for time and eternity. This is a 12-month commitment. But it is a faith promise. It's if God provides, you give. And you will respond in faith. How many believe God knows your name? How many believe God knows where you live? I think he knows what you have in the checking account. I think he knows how much you owe on your credit card. I think he knows all this. So I believe God can speak to you and say, this is what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to pour your life out for the next 12 months. I don't know what that amount will be. Let me tell a story and then we'll pray. I'm doing exactly what I'm doing right now a couple years ago. Standing on the platform behind me to my right is the pastor of that church. And I'm encouraging people, pray. Ask God what you would have you to, to write down and have faith to give for the next 12 months. He calls the next week and tells this story. I don't know any of this is going on. He tells this story. He said, I'm standing there and I'm praying and God speaks an amount into my mind and spirit. And he says, I said to God, you must have made a mistake. And he begins to explain to God why he had made a mistake. He said, God, you know that my wife is going through radiation treatments right now for a tumor at the base of her brain where it connects to the spine. You know the extra expense that we're going through and all that this is costing. And he said, God continued, and he said, I knew it was God's voice. He said, it wasn't Stan Welch's voice. It was God's voice that was saying, this is what I want you to do. So in faith, see, this is faith promise. In faith, 
He said, with my hand trembling, I wrote the amount that God spoke to me. Here's his story. He called and he said, by one o'clock, this was happening, this happened in October. He said, by, I, he said, I had prayed and said, God, there is no way I can give November and December. No way. Much less the rest of the year. By one o'clock Sunday afternoon, his testimony was that in his hand, he had the money to give for November and December. And by seven o'clock that evening, he knew how he would be able to give the rest. Now, am I telling you, if you write something down, that by one o'clock you'll have the next two months? No. And am I telling you by seven o'clock you'll have the rest? No. What I am telling you, God will provide. There's part of the story that he doesn't know. Well, he, part of it he knows. My wife was with me and we're going to go out and have lunch with this couple after church. So after church, we get in the car. We, ha we don't know this has happened. We don't know any of this. We sit down in the car, close the door, and look at each other. And out of our mouth, at the same time, we said, we've got to write this couple a check. Now, I love you, Pastor, but I didn't come planning on writing him a check. <laughs> I wrote a check and gave to your church, but I, I, that's the, I don't do that every week. But I did that week. I got a feeling I paid November. Why? Because God was going to prove to that man, I will provide. And God said, I'm going to use you. And he testified that God made the provision for that year. We're going to take this card in our hands right now, and we're going to pray. And God's going to speak to you. Now, what I want you to do after we prayed, I want you to write down an amount that you feel that God wants to channel through you for the next 12 months. If he doesn't tell you anything, you don't have to write anything down. But I got a feeling if you'll listen, I can't see how any Christian would want to give so that others could be saved. Let's pray. Lord, I'm committed to your cause, the cause of missions. Now, what would you like to channel through me? What would you want to use of my resources? What would you release in my life to be able to give so that missions might be accomplished? Speak, I pray, to every individual in Jesus' powerful, powerful name. Amen?